So once again, thank you all for joining us. I hope that everyone and your loved ones are staying safe and well as we adjust to the new normal. I have probably joined like 10 to 20 uh, Zoom calls this week, so hopefully you all are getting as good at it as I am. Um, that being said, I don't want to compete with people eating lunch or, uh, or with microphone feedback, so if you're not speaking, just go ahead and mute yourself. That would be much appreciated. Um, if not, I think I am the host, so I have the power to mute you as well. That becomes an issue. All right, so, oh, Kathleen and Kira are saying they have no audio. Um, that's odd. Let me try. How about now, is audio working now for anybody? Yes, okay, much better. And can people still see the screen? Yes, okay, great. So hopefully we'll uh, start seeing a few answers show up in the chat, but over 13 million metric tons of plastic end up in blank each year. What do we think? I'm seeing landfill, the ocean landfill. All right, Yesenia is correct. Um, all that plastic ends up in the ocean each year. What percent of all plastic products are recycled? Any guesses? Eight percent. Yesenia is getting really close on these. Nine percent of all plastic products are recycled. What percent of food grown, processed, and transported in the U.S. will never be consumed? Thirty percent. All right, Kira is on top of that one. Twenty-four to forty percent of food grown, processed, and transported in the U.S. will never be consumed, uh, and some of that waste happens on the, I guess, production side. So maybe a farm grew, you know, too much, so they just simply have surplus, or maybe the apples are too small or you know, something doesn't meet the cosmetic standards that grocery stores might have, so that food never even leaves the farm. Um, and so in that case, it's never consumed. Um, some of that food waste also happens on the consumer side because maybe you saw a recipe and were inspired to buy kale and then get home and realized that you're never gonna cook or eat kale. So it just sat in your fridge until it uh, went bad. Um, so that's why it's such a wide range. That waste is kind of hard to pin by because it happens at so many different levels, uh, but that's, that is a big one. And then lastly, waste hauling, waste hauling costs CSUN approximately how much each year? Any guesses on that one? Five hundred thousand. Okay, kind of in the ballpark. We're looking at about three hundred thousand dollars each year that CSUN spends uh, just to have that waste hauled away from the campus. Uh, a few other reasons why CSUN is pursuing zero waste. Uh, we've got state legislation pushing us in that direction. Uh, Assembly Bills 341 and 1826 are both good examples of that if you want to look those up on your own time. Uh, we also have the CSU Sustainability Policy, though the Chancellor's Office has released a sustainability policy applying to the entire CSU, uh, which establishes certain goals relating to waste. One of them would be 80% um, reduction in landfill material by the year 2020. I don't know of any CSU campus that achieved that goal by 2020, 
Um, but beyond that, uh, the policy, you know, prescribes us to uh, pursue zero waste as well. So um, we know it's coming down the pipe eventually. So how did CSUN develop its zero waste plan? We put together a working group of pretty much all the different operational units on campus. You can see those eight up there at the top. And then we looked at best practices across, you know, other universities, municipalities, um, government agencies, things like that, and tried to identify best practices and then adapt those best practices to our own campus. Um, we looked very extensively at our own CSUN waste stream. What is in our trash? What are we sending to the landfill uh, versus the recycling bin? Or, you know, what else can we do with this material? And so we tried to adapt these best practices to the campus. Uh, we ended up with eight areas of focus, sorry, seven areas of focus for the plan, uh, general strategies, buildings, grounds, programs and processes, events and services, policies, and then recommended practices. So if you do go look at the zero waste plan, you'll see it broken down into those seven categories. Uh, and then each of those categories contains a number of different strategies. So we have 80, around 80 strategies total. Here are a few examples of them. Uh, one would be having three stream receptacles at every waste disposal location. So you probably have seen those hopefully by now uh, at the interior spaces of campus. So the black, blue, and green bins, uh, those trios sitting next to each other. Um, anywhere that you have a trash can, you should also have a recycling bin or a compost bin. So that's what we've done in all of our indoor spaces and that will eventually move, we will expand that to our outdoor bins as well. Uh, another strategy would be to have, another one of our strategies is to have a zero waste education program. So releasing, you know, uh, educational videos, blog posts, articles, um, you know, things, or what do you want to call it? Uh, webinars like we're doing right now. Um, so lots of avenues through which we can educate people around zero waste because this is an initiative that we need people to have some knowledge about if they are to participate. And we're not going to make it to zero waste without uh, large scale participation. Removing waste receptacles from classrooms, this would be kind of hand in hand with having those three stream receptacles at every waste station. So rather than add a recycling bin and a compost bin to every single one of our classrooms on campus, it makes more sense from bin purchasing perspective, a bag purchasing perspective, and a custodial perspective of servicing all those bins, it makes the most sense to remove the bins from classrooms and instead put larger bins in the hallways, near stairwells, building exits, and locations where uh, classroom occupants will walk by those bins as they leave the building. So that's what we've done in most of those spaces. I think Sierra Hall, for example, we removed about 80 classroom-sized waste receptacles that all, you know, all the classrooms in Sierra Hall only had one of those trash cans. And we were seeing lots of recyclable material, you know, bottles and cans, um, as well as compostable material such as banana peels ending up in those bins. And we knew that if we didn't remove them, well, we knew that removing them was the only way to get people to, to go the extra mile or the extra 30 feet in this case to the three stream station where they could actually put their waste in the proper bin. Uh, another strategy would be expanding reusables through CSUN Dining. So uh, I don't know how many of you know this, but you can actually get a 30 cent discount on any prepared beverage if you bring your own cup to CSUN Dining. And so one of our strategies would be to expand that, uh, maybe expand incentives, um, and then encourage people to, you know, utilize other reusables, not just a cup, but maybe silverware or straws as well. Um, because food service items do represent a very large portion of the waste in our waste stream. Um, and then Elliot pointed out you can get 99 cent coffee refills. I think that's with the red uh, CSUN dining cup as well. A few other strategies would be installing hand dryers in our restrooms. Um, about, well, in depending on the building, up to 20 to 30 percent of the waste from any building could be paper towels just from our restrooms. Um, so installing hand dryers in our restrooms could really go a long way in not just reducing you know, the amount of waste we produce, but reducing our costs as well. Uh, CSUN spends about $100,000 a year on purchasing paper towels. And then we also pay our custodians to stock them in the restrooms and then we're paying our waste hauler to haul that material off. So uh, hand dryers is a big one. Yesenia, you have your hand up? Yes, I do. <clears throat> um, I have two questions. Okay. One, um, I know that we've like, um, we've switched to quote unquote comp compostable um, cups and straws and like forks and spoons, but mm -hmm. um, I know that they're not, they're only compostable um, through like machines or through specific. Um, mm -hmm. 
I'll I, I actually know, touch but... on that one a little bit later. Um, so I will okay. answer that question in a couple of slides. Um, but what was the other okay, one? Okay, okay. I'll just wait. Yeah, I guess they'll just, they could just wait till the end. Okay, cool. Thank um, you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, zero waste purchasing policy. Obviously, you know, we looked at all the material leaving campus, but looking at all the material entering campus uh, is, of course, another way to kind of gauge what we uh, what we're producing and then having more uh, more control and oversight of the material coming to campus um, will make a really big difference. You know, if people are, are allowed to just buy things willy nilly, we're going to end up with a lot of garbage as opposed to if we can, um, you know, kind of in line with the sort of education, steer people towards making um, less wasteful purchasing decisions. Student housing move in and out practices is a really big one that Associated Students has helped us with. Um, if any of you remember moving in or out of dorms during your college experience, there's a lot of waste that gets left behind. A lot of it is perfectly usable. Televisions, bicycles, cleaning supplies, appliances, things that students don't have room for in their car or don't want to you know, deal with the hassle of transporting back home and then back to campus uh, the next year. So we have partnered with associated students to provide ways for that material to be stored over the summer so that things like brooms and cleaning supplies can just be given to the next uh, round of students moving in the next semester rather than having them go to Target and buying all that brand new stuff um, when the previous round of residents just threw it all away. Uh, and then composting all campus yard debris is another strategy. We actually uh, finally have that operation running uh, successfully. It's been a couple of years in the making, but now all of the material that comes from our campus grounds is, uh, so this would be like tree trimmings, grass clippings, and other landscaping waste is taken to a site between the baseball and softball fields and then our grounds crew chips it down into fine material and then they line it up and let it break down over time uh, and then we sift it into mulch and compost and then that compost gets spread on our lawns and planters uh, so we're actually fertilizing the campus with nutrients that came from the campus as well. So those are just a few of our strategies as I mentioned there are over 80 of them if you want to go check out the zero waste plan you can go into uh, you know look at each of those in more detail. So this is a kind of a snapshot of what we hope the zero waste plan will achieve. Um, on the left would be the year 2018, and you can see the breakdown of where all the material leaving campus went in 2018. So uh, about 48% of it went to the landfill, right, this big black wedge, and then this large chunk right here was recycled, which is great. This little green sliver is what was composted from, then this is the food waste composting, the green piece, and then this kind of beige, tan, orangey chunk is the green waste composting. So the, uh, we actually were still composting our green waste in 2018, but it was being done off-site. We were paying our waste hauler to truck it 100 miles away uh, and then compost it, and then we were actually uh, getting the compost back from them. Now we're keeping that all on site. So you don't see that bar getting any larger over time through 2025, uh, but it's now being ha managed on campus. The Probably the most major growth uh, or change in our waste stream moving forward will be the diversion of our food waste, this green organic slash compost section. Uh, by 2025, you see that taking up probably 25 to 30 percent of our total waste stream. That's what it represents right now, but currently a lot of that is going into the landfill, or it was, and we now have the, uh, the green bins for that, for that waste stream, uh, but that's one of the biggest areas of improvement that we expect to see is to be diverting a lot more of that food waste from the landfill. This little red sliver would be reuse programs. So we have uh, two different on-campus reuse programs, one of which is asset management. So uh, for campus-owned assets such as furniture or electronics, uh, I think furniture is probably the biggest one. Um, you can actually get things for free that other departments have uh, decided they no longer use. So uh, I think filing cabinets are a big one right now. As departments go paperless, they end up with filing cabinets they don't need. Uh, and those go to asset management. So you can actually check on their website or call, I don't know the extension off the top of my head, but they'll be able to tell you what items they have. So if you're looking for an office chair or maybe a conference table, um, a desk or things like that, you could get that for free from the campus instead of buying a brand new version that has to be you know, packaged and shipped here. Uh, and then we end up with all that packaging waste as well as that old item that, that we could have used on campus. Now we you know, have to figure out how to do something with it. So we see those programs getting a little bit larger um, right now, they represent a very small sliver of our total diversion. Um, you know, they're kind of lumped into the landfill right now. But as that, as we bring more of those programs online and more people are aware of them, we're hoping that they'll, they'll be more heavily utilized. 
Um, the other reuse program on campus is through Associated Students, which is the Recycle L listserv. So the non, I guess the campus assets that can be consumed, such as um, post-it notes, markers, things like that, that don't fall under the purview of asset management, those can be given to Associated Students. Uh, and then every Monday they send out an email to the entire listserv saying, here's what we have available. Um, you know, you can come pick it up for free or they'll actually deliver it to your department for free as well. Um, so binders are probably one of the biggest items that they have. Uh, the campus still purchases thousands of dollars of binders each year. Um, but at the same time, you know, I see boxes of binders sitting by trash cans. So I know it's something that we're throwing away and getting rid of as we bring in brand new ones. And so Associated Students actually has collected hundreds and hundreds of binders. Uh, they sort through the ones and you know, they sort through them and throw away the ones that are no longer needed. Uh, or not in good condition rather. Uh, and then, so if your department needs binders, you can pick those up for free from associated students, um, help us reduce our waste and save some money as well. This gray bar up here would be paper towel diversion. So I mentioned that is a significant portion of our waste stream. Um, and you see that kind of coming online in 2020. So we give ourselves a little bit of time to figure that one out. And then lastly, this hashed gray wedge on top would be source reduction, which literally just refers to making less garbage uh, buying fewer things that, that will end up as waste. So that a great example of this would be the reusable coffee cup that I mentioned. You know, by not getting that single-use coffee cup, you are reducing waste at the source. Uh, and we know that we're not going to get to zero waste without this source reduction. You see it taking up, you know, probably almost 10% of our overall waste stream is what we expect to be able to reduce moving forward. So some of the challenges uh, surrounding this, um, Four and a quarter pounds per minute. That is what CSUN sends to the landfill 24-7, 365. So if you have a desk side bin, um, imagine you're at your office desk, uh, imagine you have a desk side bin and that is totally full of trash. That represents about four and a quarter pounds of waste. And that is, so imagine us sending one of those to the landfill every single minute. Um, the other challenge or another challenge would be lacking infrastructure. So as I mentioned, we do not yet have that three stream bin system outside. Uh, so people do not have the opportunity to compost or recycle all of their waste items outside on campus. They have to go into a building to do so, um, but we're hoping to bridge that gap in the next uh, several months. Uh, constant education is a big one because we have you know, 10,000 new students arriving on our campus every year who have no idea what waste disposal looks like at CSUN. So we're you know, frequently and constantly re-educating the next round of students. Um, volatile markets is another big one. Recycling is, you know, and it's an economy and it's a, an industry that, that relies on people buying the recyclable product. Um, and so with markets shifting due to um, countries like China banning the import of different recyclable commodities, recyclers are struggling to, um, you know, to take and recycle all the same materials that they could a few years ago. Um, Associated students, for example, saw the price of a bale of cardboard drop from $100 to $20, mile, or to $20 in just a couple of months. So they're no longer able to sustain their cardboard operations because they're no longer making money by selling that end product. A um, couple of questions, are both these programs open to students too? Uh, the Recycle L, I believe, is open to students and they actually have one targeted specifically towards students called Student L. And then I don't believe asset management is open to students because it's intended for on-campus reuse. So it's, it's open to campus departments. Uh, another question, is there any possibility? Oh, and then Kira mentioned that Student L is on Matador Exchange. Yeah, so that is the, uh, kind of the student-geared uh, reuse program. Elliot asked, is there any possibility the used office furniture and other such assets could be made available to purchase for personal use? That's a great question. So office furniture that isn't sold or isn't reused on campus within a certain amount of time goes to a vendor, I believe, called Ken Porter Auctions. And at that point, uh, I think it's an online auction that is available to the public and you would be able to purchase it through that. Uh, and then the campus receives a percentage of, um, you know, all of the campus items that were sold. There's also a, um, an online government auction site I don't know exactly what it is off the top of my head, but you would find it on the asset management website. And on that website, you can purchase items for personal use. Um, once they have kind of been released from, uh, from availability to the campus, if that makes sense. So lastly, one of our other challenges would be the inconsistent messages. Uh, so this is kind of talking, touching back on uh, Yesenia's question about the 
the serviceware food for food service that we have uh, that says compostable. So like those clear cups that say like eco label on them and say, you know, compostable plastic or biodegradable. Um, we right after we had designed all of our signage for that green organics bin, our waste hauler came back and said, oh, we actually can't really accept any of this material right now. And so I guess what was happening was that their composting facility was finding that that material didn't really break down, even though it was an industrial composting facility. And then the, the growers who were buying that compost from the facility did not like the, you know, the little fragments of, um, you know, that bioplastic and things in there. So it doesn't lead to a, a quality product that they're able to sell. Um, which is really tricky from a consumer side because now you have a plastic cup that feels and acts just like plastic. And then it says compostable on it with a little recycling symbol with the number seven, but it's supposed to go in the landfill bin. Because it's that bioplastic, it can't be recycled like a traditional plastic. And because it's, you know, the, the composting facility doesn't want it, it has to go in the landfill bin. So that's kind of one example of that inconsistent messaging. Um, then I'll go more into that when we talk about the, the organics or compost waste stream in particular. Uh, so these photos that you see around the perimeter are from a waste audit done by our waste hauler. So twice a semester, sorry, twice a year, they uh, sort through a representative sample of our waste to characterize it and tell us what, what our waste stream is composed of. So this one I believe was 40% soiled paper. So in this top left corner, um, you know, a huge portion of that is going to be paper towels, but also paper plates and cups would fall into that category. Um, once again, all food service where, you know, we have a whole bunch of food down here in the bottom middle. Uh, all these uh, plastic cups on the bottom right. Um, obviously, you know, the plastic number five is recyclable, which is nice, but every single one of these cups could have been a reusable cup. And then, you know, none of this would have even gone into our waste stream to begin with. Um, and yeah, so. Moving on, we're just going to dive into each of those three waste streams that you now see on campus. So the landfill stream. What is a landfill? It is basically a big pit in the ground. Um, you know, just dig a huge hole in the ground that we fill with trash. And uh, landfills typically are lined with a plastic lining as well as like a clay lining at the bottom that keeps all of the lovely garbage juices from seeping into the water table. These tend to work pretty well for several years. Um, but eventually, you know, they do break down as well. Plastics are not, you know, chemically inert. And so over time, they do eventually break down. Um, and, you know, so landfills are not great for the environment, not great for the local groundwater. Um, there aren't a lot of other ways to take care of our trash, unfortunately. Um, but that's what a landfill is. What goes into the landfill would be a few different things. Paper plates and cups, as I mentioned, plastic utensils. Even though paper plates and cups are primarily paper, uh, we can't put them in with the paper recycling because they actually have a plastic lining on them. Um, you know, paper is not waterproof. And so if you have a, a paper item designed to hold liquids, you have to coat it with a thin layer of plastic. And there's no way to separate the plastic from that paper uh, in a way that is economic and allows them both to be recycled. So that's why those all go into the trash. Plastic utensils as well, they're made of all types of different plastic and they're not labeled. So they're very hard to sort uh, and it's tough to you know, sort them in a way that allows you to resell that plastic. So once again, those go in the trash. Um, plastic wrap and bags, uh, a lot of them will have a recycling symbol on them, or well, what we think of as the recycling symbol, the three arrows with the number in the middle. And really that, that symbol, it doesn't actually denote something as recyclable. That symbol was designed by the American Chemical Society to identify the type of plastic resin used for that product. So most of those will have, will have a number four in there. And even though you might think of it as a recycling symbol, it does not mean that it's recyclable. So, you know, if you have something like a cereal bag, um, a grocery bag, plastic wrap, you know, something that you would not want your toddler playing with, uh, those would not go in the landfill bin. Or, sorry, they would go in the landfill bin and they are not recyclable, even though they are plastic. Uh, cardboard food containers is another one that goes in the landfill. And I called it out because it can be kind of confusing. We think of cardboard as being recyclable. Uh, but if you have cardboard with, you know, donut icing all over it or, you know, pizza grease soaked into it, that is not going to be recyclable, you know, especially whenever you mix it in with a whole bunch of clean cardboard, it, you risk contaminating the rest of that. Um, so that's kind of the landfill stream in a nutshell. I will say that, you know, it's a little bit more complicated than that. We'll put a, a more comprehensive resource up here for you all to, to look at on your own time. Um, 
And then I guess lastly, does anyone, Never mind. no one knows where our landfills are, I'm guessing. Um, this is where our landfills are. So we've got CSUN right here, uh, this little blue dot. Uh, and then our waste goes to either the Chiquita Canyon landfill or the Victorville landfill up here. Um, this is almost like 100 miles away. You know, that's a really long drive. So pretty much anything you've ever thrown away on our campus uh, in the last three years and probably in the next three years in case anything drastic, unless something drastic happens, it's going to be sitting in one of these two landfills um, long after we're all retired. So that's just something to keep in mind. You know, these landfills are gonna fill up eventually. Um, obviously, just judging from the map, it's pretty difficult to build landfills near major cities. You know, nobody wants them in their backyard. It's expensive to build landfills and waste hauling costs are going to continue going up. So, sorry, I, I see a few questions coming in. I'll get to those in a second. Um, but yeah, those are our two landfills. So Olivia, Herstein, I read in the LA Times that in LA, plastic bags, for example, salad mix bags, labeled with the recycling symbol and numbers one through seven are recyclable. What you just said contradicts that. So which is it and how do we know? So the city of LA, I believe they have their, they kind of, they have a separate waste hauling contract than we do. So their waste haulers might actually be able to separate those plastic bags and, and recycle them. Um, our waste hauler, uh, Athens Services, that, that services the campus, does not, well, they've told us that those plastic bags are not recyclable. Um, a few challenges around that, they're light and airy and floaty. So in a, in a sorting facility, you know, gusts of wind can actually pick them up and blow them around. And then they also tend to get wrapped up and tangled in the sorting machinery. So like if you have a vacuum cleaner, you know, you'll notice that like hair gets wrapped around the, the rolling parts. It's kind of like that same a uh, similar thing that happens with the plastic bags, you know, stretching and wrapping around the rollers. And so they have to shut down sorting, sorting machinery and untangle that. Um, our waste hauler has also told us that currently there's not really markets for plastics besides one, numbers one, two, and five. So right now, you know, we send them plastics one through seven, um, but until markets open up for those other numbers, you know, three, four, seven, um, they're really only able to sell plastics one, two, and five to companies that will go, um, you know, to, that will be able to actually sell that material. Um, yeah, so Austin uh, just reminded me kind of one thing to keep in mind is the, the different definitions of the word recyclable. Um, lots and lots and lots of different products can be, you know, can be recycled, but that doesn't mean they can be recycled economically, right? So I gave the example of coffee cups. Right, it is possible. You know, it's technolo technologically possible to separate the plastic lining from the paper cup, and then you know, shred both of those materials down back to their, you know, basic uh, parts, and then make them into new products. But it's such an expensive process that no one is able to make money doing it. You know, no one is, um, no one is actually able to recycle those economically. Um, so even though, and I think part of this would be. Uh, that the city of LA has taken a similar approach to what CSUN has done in terms of our recycling education, um, which I'll touch on kind of as we get into this next slide. So I just told you that you know, our waste hauler is only currently able to recycle plastics one, two, and five. Right here on our, on our signage, we have plastics numbers one through and seven, or one through seven. So we are still telling people to put all their plastics one through seven in the recycling bin because we don't know you know, what could happen in six months, right? Markets could shift and suddenly plastic number three can be recycled again. That way we don't have to change all of our signage. And our, you know, because our hauler breaks open every single bag and sorts every single product out, um, you know, if something ends up in there that isn't recyclable, they can sort it out. And then if that, you know, a few months from now does become recyclable, we're already putting it in the bin. Our population on campus is already used to putting it in the bin. And so it's, uh, it's easier from, from the perspective of educating a large population uh, and trying to keep up with the, the recycling industry as it changes. Uh, let's see, so uh, touching on our recycling stream, what goes in that bin? Clean paper, cardboard and paperboard, uh, aluminum cans, aluminum trays and aluminum foil as well. So if you, you know, ball up your aluminum foil, they'll actually sort it out. They have this really cool machine that uses a magnet to repel aluminum into a separate bin. Um, and so you can, you can put you know, other aluminum items in that bin. Uh, I will say the cleaner they are, the more likely they are to be recycled. Uh, so you know, if you have a, a 
plastic salad tray that you ate your salad in that is you know full of an oily salad dressing it's a lot less likely to be recycled than you know the exact same container that is totally clean um, you know it's still up to you whether or not you want to you know wash your peanut butter jar and put it in the recycling bin but i'll say it's a lot more likely to be recycled if you do so uh, empty aerosol cans tin cans and other metals can also go in that recycling bin uh, and our waste hauler will sort them out Metal remains one of the most profitable materials to recycle. I just took probably like 10 full garbage cans uh, of material to a recycling center. And I want to say that about you know 30% of that material was aluminum, but 90% of the money we got for all the recyclables was for the aluminum. So even though it, you know, it only made up 30% of the overall product, it was so much more valuable than the plastic and the glass. Um, you know, the other seven uh, bags full of material only gave, you know, only only made a couple of bucks off of that or, you know, $10 as opposed to the three bags of aluminum, you know, made us the other 80. Uh, so what else? Numbered rigid plastics, as I mentioned, um, so no plastic wrapper bags in the recycling. Um, you will see some grocery stores have that canister kind of outside for only the plastic bags. Um, and so I mentioned the difference between, you know, re technically recyclable and economically recyclable. Um, you can actually, you know, we are able to economically recycle that plastic wrap, but only if it's in its very own waste stream separated from everything else. So if you do want to recycle your plastic wrap and bags, um, it's best to find a grocery store that has one of those canisters out front where everyone puts their bags in. Because once they're already separated, it's a lot easier. You don't have to, you know, pay the costs to sort all that material out from everything else. Um, glass is also still recyclable on our campus, um, you know, glass bottles and jars. They don't want broken windows or laboratory glass, things like that, um, but glass bottles and jars are okay. So getting into our organics waste stream, um, hopefully you can all see the sticker up there, right? Food waste, food soil, paper, compostable food service items. Um, I designed this sign and I can't say I'm super proud of it because I have seen a lot of people stand in front of a bin with an arm full of items and you know very confused as to what goes in each bin so we have a um new sticker actually if you just keep a close eye on that a label up there um we'll be making everything much more clear you ready two one boom food waste only so that is our new uh sign for the green bin we're hoping that it is a lot less confusing um, you know calls out only food waste and then also specifies no wrappers, containers, or cups. Those are some of the most common contaminants in that food waste stream. Um, and as we mentioned, our waste hauler, you know, is no longer accepting a lot of those items. So let's see. Uh, this does include, you know, animal products as well. You can put dairy, um, meat, and bones into that food waste stream. And as I mentioned before. Uh, you know, you can go a lot more detailed and high level into all of this kind of sorting guidelines. Um, rather than doing that now, I just put this URL up here, uh, csun.edu slash zero waste. There's a resources tab that has a more comprehensive sorting guidelines for what goes into each bin. Um, we are updating that regularly as well. So if you have any questions that are not answered by that resource, please let me know. Um, you can email energy.sustainability at csun.edu. Um, I can tell you, you know, directly over the phone what goes in each bin and then that also helps me update the uh, online resource you know if, if you have a question about something chances are somebody else uh, is also confused so you know by asking those questions you know you're not bothering me you are helping me keep this resource updated uh, for those of you eating lunch just quick heads up i'm going to show some close-ups of our garbage in a second so uh, just an fyi i do want to touch on the food waste a little bit more because uh, it's something that I have seen. Oh, sorry, quick question. Um, there are two questions. So are the compostable cups slash utensils able to go in the plastic waste now? Uh, no, they are not because they're not technically petroleum-based plastics the, the same way that other plastics are. So they can't be recycled like normal plastics. They are a, a bioplastic, if you will, uh, and they can't be recycled like normal plastics, which is super confusing because they look and behave to a consumer exactly like normal plastics, um, but those should go in the landfill bin. And the outdoor landfill signage we've designed does have those products on there to helpfully clarify that those go in the landfill bin as well. Um, Kleenex or yogurt cups, 
So I think yogurt cups are plastic number five typically. So those would be, um, those would go into the recycling bin. Um, Kleenex itself would go in the landfill bin. Um, and yeah, and if you're talking about the Kleenex boxes, uh, those would be recyclable as cardboard. Did that answer your question, Kathleen? No, okay, great. So touching a little bit more on food waste. There we go. So these are some photos from a waste audit that I did. Right here we have an entire one gallon Ziploc freezer bag full of egg rolls. Um, over here is one full of butternut squash, at least that's what I think it was. Um, you know, here we have some mini quiche, and of course right here we have a huge bag full of hot dogs. Um, this is not what the green bin is for. Okay, the green bin is for our banana peels, you know, the, the inedible food scraps, right? Putting this type of stuff in the green bin is only slightly less wasteful than putting it in the landfill bin because it's all perfectly edible food, right? I'm sure we all know hungry students who would have loved to receive a whole bunch of free food. I'm sure some of us are sitting at home right now wishing that we had, you know, perfectly good food sitting in our freezer um, instead of having, you know, thrown it away. So one of the recommendations I'll make later on is to, you know, simply eat the leftovers, make sure that they get eaten um, because wasting, you know, Putting, putting food scraps into the green bin makes total sense. You know, we recycle those nutrients into compost and soil. Putting edible food in the compost is a waste of edible food. So, um, sorry if, if that uh, disturbed anybody's lunch, but I just wanted to touch on that. So what else can you do besides sorting your waste properly? Um, making a zero waste kit and using it, I think is one of the biggest things. Um, take a tote bag, Put in, you know, a metal fork, spoon, and knife. Maybe a metal straw if you have one of those. Um, a thermos, you know, if you're a regular coffee drinker, or a water bottle, uh, a cloth napkin, and then a Tupperware container. So, you know, just keep that in a tote bag and then carry it around with you. If you need to make a separate one for your car, um, one for work, and one for home, that you know is totally fine. You can get silverware and cloth napkins super, super cheap at a thrift store. Um, and I can't tell you how much free food I've gotten. From events just because I had a Tupperware container with me and was able to take it with me. Um, you know, you'll you'll be able to avoid a lot of styrofoam to-go containers as well just by having a, a regular to-go container with you. Uh, reuse items on campus. So I mentioned those two, um, you know, those two resources of asset management and the recycle listserv. Make a process paperless. I think this is something a lot of us might be learning how to do now that we're all working remotely. Um, you know, digital signatures are, you know, a you can use a digital signature to buy a house, right? So there's no reason that we shouldn't be able to do it to you know, authorize a student reimbursement for travel or something like that. So if you are, you know, if there's a process in your department that you do frequently where somebody you know, prints something, signs it and scans it and emails it to someone else who prints it, signs it and scans it, um, learn how to use Adobe Sign. You know, the, the university has a free license for Adobe Sign. It's very simple uh, to become a sender. You can also just add signature fields to PDF documents in uh, Adobe Acrobat, I believe, as well. So, you know, play around with that, figure out if you can make a process paperless. Eat or donate leftovers, as I mentioned. Um, you know, we should be eating all the edible food. The green bin is just for the inedible food scraps like apple cores and banana peels. Uh, use rechargeable batteries. Um, batteries have to go through environmental health and safety. They are hazardous waste. Um, and, you know, whenever my mouse battery dies, I just walk over to the little uh, container, grab a, a fresh charged battery, and put my Drain battery in the, the bin to be recharged, right? So my department does not use any, um, you know, single-use batteries. Uh, and then give us feedback. You know, we are we're changing a lot of infrastructure and processes on the campus. We, you know, we don't know nearly as much as as you all do in terms of how your department functions. So let us know what's working. Let us know what doesn't work. Um, you know, if things could be improved, please tell us, and we'll be, you know, happy to make things better because we want this to work for everyone on campus. Uh, initiating a pilot strategy, you know, if you have an idea for something in your department that can be done uh, and, you know, maybe need a little bit of help or support in order to get that initiated, um, we would love to play that role and help you out with that. Um, I put do a waste audit in parentheses, you know, you don't have to glove up and, and start digging through your trash, but maybe just peek in there, uh, keep an eye on your own personal bin, um, you know, pay attention to what's being left outside of your, you know, your departments or offices door, you know, for uh, like maybe in the hallway and just pay attention to what 
waste uh, is being generated in your space because that's a great way to identify the ways to reduce it. Uh, and then teach someone what you've learned. You know, if this webinar was really helpful, uh, we'll send out the recording and you can share that with folks as well. Um, you know, we have, this has been really well attended, so I'm, I'm really impressed with that. Uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of us are gonna come away with brand new knowledge and by sharing that knowledge with other people, um, you know, we can magnify the impact that we have. Uh, and then lastly, taking the zero waste pledge. So csun.edu slash zero waste, as I mentioned before, we are restructuring this website a little bit right now. So the pledge is not super easy to find at the moment, but it will be, um, you know, I'll be working on that later today. So you can go on there, take the pledge and sign up to, you know, complete certain activities such as not using um, single use plastic bags, you know, bringing your own bags with you, um, carrying your own coffee cup, things like that. Um, so that's just a way to kind of maybe help help yourself, help you hold yourself accountable um, to do these things. So that's all I have. I will open it up for questions now. I see some chat going on. I see some things you know, being discussed in the chat. Um, I think Austin answered Yesenia's question about you know, cleaning things, making them more recyclable and more likely to be recycled. Um, any other questions? I do have a question. It's me, Asenia. Um, I wanted to know how students can be part of this zero waste plan and like the logistics of it. Because um, it seems to me that like it's um, being like guided by um, faculty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a great point. I think a lot of our you know, education efforts and outreach things are geared towards faculty and staff, but the student population obviously represents a lot more people. Uh, Associated Students uh, has a team called the Trash Talkers, and they do tablings at the Sierra Center on a regular basis. And so they, that's a student team that stands out there. And as people approach the bin, they, you know, kind of stop them and have a quick conversation with them about what goes in each bin. Um, we've enlisted student volunteers for help on waste audits as well. Uh, and then the that same team, the Trash Talkers, I believe, is working on presenting to um, some of the U100 classes as, um, you know, just a way to reach a lot more students. I have presented on this topic to our um, our new student orientation, like leaders, you know, the, that the student ambassadors as well. Uh, and we are hoping to create kind of some ways to tie some waste initiatives to the student academic experience. So maybe, you know, once we get a better, um, once we start getting, you know, waste data from, from our waste hauler because we just renewed our contract with them, um, you know, maybe we can create opportunities for students to look through that data and identify, you know, weaknesses or opportunities in what we're doing to improve. Uh, but we are, yeah, I will say that we, we do want more involvement from students. Um, we want them all to know how to sort things, um, which is really tough, you know, whenever you're late for a class and you have, you know, 10 seconds to put everything in the bins, um, you know, getting someone to stand there and, and learn what goes in each bin is obviously very difficult and, and tough to compete with all their other priorities. Um, so, yeah, I guess it kind of digressed into the challenges a little bit, but students are on our radar and that is a population that we, we want to be engaging a lot more. Cool. Um, is it like a meeting that is that um, that plans the zero waste plan? Like, because maybe students can be involved in that process. And yeah, because I've never heard of this zero waste plan until now. Mm -hmm. So the, I guess most of we do have a zero waste working group, and that group meets uh, I want to say twice a semester, um, and we most of the work happens kind of between those meetings. So those meetings just kind of, we, we use them to identify which initiatives to be tackling in the coming year. Uh, a lot of it is also kind of funding and resource dependent. So it would be, it's definitely possible for students to attend those meetings and we can make them, uh, we can do a better job of publicizing them. Um, and then we are, I guess I was just reminded that we are working with Associated Students Marketing Team to push out some more content. So hopefully they'll be able to give us a better idea of what sort of content students gravitate towards. Um, but as far as the student like decision-making involvement opportunities, I think those are um, somewhat more limited. Yeah, but aside from attending that meeting, uh, it would be difficult, I believe. Yeah. Austin, okay. is there anything? Mm -hmm. 
sorry, I just wanted to add because I'm really interested in like, being part of um, like this committee or whatever. I know that um, the USU has different committees revolving um, like diversity and inclusion and different things like that, but I don't see any like sustainability committees. And I was wondering if that's something that you all are working towards. That is something we would like to see student government spearhead. Um, some past administrations have been very interested in that. There was a, I want to say it was a standing committee, a uh, student committee for sustainability that we met with regularly uh, and you know collaborated with on a number of initiatives. Um, but it, I believe it was dissolved um, three semesters ago, maybe more. Um, so I'm hoping you know, whenever, whenever new student, um, student body president and vice president are elected, Austin and I, um, he, Austin is the uh, director of energy and sustainability, but he and I meet with them to, you know, talk about what we hope to accomplish for the campus and ways for them to get involved. Um, priorities don't always align. And of course they have a lot of other things on their plate. Um, but I would, I would say that, that the, uh, the student government side should, uh, would be the, the ones to really spearhead that and create those opportunities for students. As Sarah just mentioned in the chat, we do have 10 working groups for the sustainability plan uh, and students and employees are welcome to attend the meetings for those working groups as well. The zero waste working group is one of those, um, but we publish the meeting dates on our website as well in advance. Um, so anyone who wants to is able to attend those. And those are a way to you know, learn about what is going on in each of the different areas of the sustainability plan. Uh, a question from Kathleen, have you noticed a difference since you put the three bins in all the buildings? So we have done, well, our waste hauler performed one waste audit since we put the new bins in all of our buildings. And the actually they only audited the recycling waste stream and the landfill waste stream. So we don't yet have a set of data that we feel really good about in terms of analyzing the, the big difference. Um, but I want to say that since then, since putting in the new bins, we have had about 50 tons of material uh, in the organics, you know, our food waste stream. So that's all food waste that would have gone into the uh, landfill. And I think that 50 tons was over uh, starting in October. So October, November, December, um, January. And I think we did the audit in February. Um, Austin, correct me if I'm wrong. But, um, but yeah, so in those four months, uh, 50 tons of organic waste was recovered that would not have been recovered otherwise. Um, so gonna, oh, sorry. Oh, awesome. I was gonna add a little bit to that. So we are working with our hauler to get uh, more updated information. Uh, we're also working on getting that information into a user-friendly dashboard. So if you've seen our utility dashboards out there, um, it will be very similar to that, but um, I was just talking with the, the consultants that we're working on this project with, and it should be ready mid-April. Um, so all of that data will flow into there, and then we will have essentially live up to the month um, diversion data. So more to come there for sure. Olivia, you have a question? Yes. Thank you for the presentation. It's really good. Can you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Okay. Um, in the name of sharing what you've learned, so um, I just wanted to give a little bit of feedback in terms of challenges and then ask a question. Mm -hmm. um, I work in University Hall, so this is specific to faculty or staff question. Um, when the zero waste bins were rolled out, um, we were excited to see them, but we had no idea they were coming and it caused a lot of um, confusion in our office because they just kind of showed up. Um, we didn't know what to do with them. They were plunked in the middle of our hallways. They kind of blocked access. Um, and then like the information came later. So once we got over that, that was great. And then we've noticed some mixed messages or strange things happening in University Hall. and. If this is only unique to University Hall, I apologize to everybody else, but I have a feeling it might be happening elsewhere. Um, our like personal trash cans were removed. Were um, we had the option of removing them, and we heard that other departments were getting upset. 
Like, don't take my trash can. I don't want to have to sort my own trash. Most of us were fine to do that, but then we were told, okay, no, wait. And then there were stickers on them and our trash cans were left. Um, Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, we were all getting into the sorting of zero waste and our students were excited about it. And um, our staff was getting into it and learning more. But then the trash cans were left. And then what I noticed was that we had, um, I don't know if it was PPM or different uh, janitorial services coming in. And I noticed almost every evening um, the, the stuff that we'd put in a couple of the different zero waste bins just being hauled out with the trash. So mm-hmm. my question is, um, I'm wondering if once we return to campus, hopefully that will be soon, God willing, is there something that we could do with a phase two to really help make things consistent and open and kind of get people more on board so that we know that our efforts are you know, not in vain? You know what I mean? So we just want to know mm-hmm. what we can do to be more consistent. Yeah, so there's two different pieces there to break down. One would be the, the deployment of the three stream bins. Uh, and the other would be the desk side bin removal. So touching on the the three stream bin deployment, that was, um, I don't think it was done in the best way possible, but there are a few reasons for that. We had applied for a grant through CalRecycle. So we received uh, just over $100,000 to purchase those bins and install them. Uh, And so there was a definite lack of communication that happened, you know, among you know between between the people doing the installing myself and austin and, and the associated students and building occupants uh, and part of that was due to the timeline we had to maintain for the grant uh, and the other part of that would be the the difficulty of communicating on such a large scale uh, i i pretty much walked through every building every campus operated building with a map of you know a floor plan of the building and identified the locations where we would be putting these bins. And I spoke with some building occupants throughout that process. Uh, And then we also compiled a list of the deans and AVPs and folks at the the head of each department. And whenever we went into a building, we would send an email to to those folks saying, we're deploying new bins in your building. Here's the the intention behind it. And would you please pass this on to your staff? That message did not always trickle down, which is why there was a lot of, a lack of awareness um, you know, at, at a lot of levels and in a lot of places about what those new bins were for. So now we are, you know, having a lot of requests to go in and present to different departments about what the new bins are for. Um, you know, we're happy to do that. And we, we're we having trouble uh, accomplishing the education, you know, simultaneously with the deployment, right? You mentioned that the education piece came afterwards and that was because, you know, all the resources that we could devote to, do, to zero waste were being spent on deploying the physical infrastructure um, rather than you know creating the educational material. Uh, the we had a few different options in terms of the approach that we were able to take, and we went the route of you know deploying in every building as much as we could, um, rather than you know spending a lot of time with a single department talking to those occupants and doing that education beforehand, and then putting in the uh, the bins. If we had gone that route, I think we would still be installing bins. So it was a difficult choice to make between, you know, do we do we do everything, you know, kind of okay, you know, do we do a kind of okay job of deploying everywhere, or do we do a great job of deploying, you know, one building at a time? Uh, and that was the, the decision that had to be made. Part of that was influenced by the CalRecycle grant timeline that we were working with, as well as delays on delivering the bins and needing to get them installed before the school year started. Um, so that was the reason that there was a lot of you know mixed messaging and confusion, and lack of awareness about that. Regarding the desk side bin removal, um, as I mentioned, you know we had that timeline and had to get all those bins in place pretty quickly. Um, the result of that was that custodial was suddenly servicing far more bins than they were ever doing before. You know, um, we we tried to remove those central trash cans and central recycling bins whenever we deployed the new central three stream bins, um, but there were still all those desk side bins. And so even now custodial is taking out, um, you know, twice as much capacity in terms of bin space each day as we have dumpster space, right? So if every one of the bins that custodial serviced, um, you know, right now 
were full, it would be twice as much as we could fit in any of our dumpsters. And so there's a lot of inefficiency going on on that side. We do hope to scale back, you know, the work that Custodial is doing. But as you mentioned, there is that, well, that's where that communication comes into place. Um, and once again, we made the choice of doing everything, doing a kind of okay job of communicating with everyone as opposed to doing a much better and probably more effective job of communicating with smaller populations one at a time. Um, and we've gotten a lot of feedback to that effect, you know, saying, I would have loved to go in and meet with every single department one at a time uh, before you know, rolling out something so controversial and significant because this is really the first time that we're asking people to play a very active role in a sustainability initiative that does impact what they do on a daily basis. And you're right, and that's not something that you can just suddenly do with a post-it note, which is why there has been you know, a certain amount of backlash and, uh, and mixed messaging going on because um, we're trying to you know, figure out how, how to best handle that. Um, it didn't, you know, it was such an unsuccessful rollout of that program that we scaled it back. Um, and so that's why you see, you know, sometimes the bins are being serviced and in some places they are and in some places uh, people are still servicing themselves. Um, and so, you know, it is still a drain on our custodial resources at the moment, but we would, um, you know, we're wanting to, to work within the, uh, the constraints of, you know, actual maintaining our personal relationships, right? We are asking for people's cooperation and we're not gonna achieve that by going in and making them upset about their bins. So approaching it from more of an educational perspective, um, making sure that they know the reasoning behind it and, you know, the impact that they can have, the positive impact that they can have um, by participating, I think is gonna be key. Um, and in terms of, you know, getting that message out to the entire campus, it is, difficult to do. This is not a time to be sending campus-wide emails on that topic. Um, and even if this weren't happening, you know, if COVID-19 weren't happening, I don't think we'd be able to send campus-wide emails on that topic. Uh, we're working through the HR newsletter to kind of centralize communications in that regard or have a, you know, an avenue through which we can communicate with all of our employees. Uh, and then we are also, you know, as I said, revamping the website to hopefully house, you know, centralize all of that information and make it consistent across the board. Um, that being said, you know, stuff happens without our knowledge. If we walked around the OVIA library um, recently and bins had moved all over the place. So there are things that go on, you know, it, it's too big of a campus for, for just Austin and I to keep track of everything that's going on in terms of waste infrastructure. Um, you know, maybe the custodians have, like, rather than them communicating with us constantly, you know, that maybe they make decisions on their own as well and communicate with building occupants on their own in ways that we're not aware of, you know. So all of that minutia that happens at the ground level does not always make it up to the ones making the planning decisions, which is why you see that bit of a disconnect. Uh, and that's something that we are, you know, hoping to reduce going forward. I'm gonna add something. Um, hearing an echo and it's on but um so olivia you had mentioned uh two two things nikhil's talked a little bit about the the communication piece um that's obviously a big challenge as he's talked to you um another big reason we've created this sustainability champions group which i think most people on this call are probably a part of um is to really help us with that communication piece, not, not necessarily just around zero waste, but that is kind of the biggest one right now. Um, again, there's only a couple of us in the, doing the daily job of sustainability. So for us to get that message out um, to everyone is a challenge. So that's why we're trying to broaden our, our group of, of influencers here. Um, and that's really what we see the sustainability champions as. Um, kind of our, our folks that we can rely on to help us with that communication. Um, so anything you need from us to help help do that would be, uh, we're more than happy to, to help you with. Um, the other piece you had mentioned was the uh, custodial folks. You've seen them putting the material into, um, into the same bin and kind of bringing it out. Um, I'm hoping they weren't dumping all the material into the same bag, um, but what their process looks like, just so everyone's familiar, um, it does, they, they do take each bag and then they put it into a, a big rolling cart and then they roll that cart out to our dumpster enclosures and then they, they separate out the bags um, to the proper dumpsters. Um, so that might be what you saw. I'm hoping that's what you've seen. Um, 
So hopefully that adds a little clarification for you. Olivia, I just saw your note about the uh, university communications team being able to help spread the word. So thank you for that as well. All right, we are just past one. I want to be mindful of everyone's time. So, um, you know, if you do have further questions, I'll stay on for another second. But uh, looks like people are already starting to trickle out. So if you do need to leave, please uh, don't hesitate to do so. And thank you all again for joining.